So I can tell you right now kind of what my thought process is. At the moment, we have for the HamSci workshop, I think six abstracts submitted so far. making me log in here. Yeah, we have, I think we've got six uh, real abstracts submitted so far. And as we get over the next week or so, as I, you know, survive getting through, getting my syllabi done for classes and writing my annual report for being a professor and like doing a million other things I have to do, um, I'm going to, I, I do have in mind like, certain people should give certain talks. Like I know Mary Lou is on the team with um, Diego and, you know, they're probably going to, we're going to have a talk from them. And I know that uh, the Tangerine group, we're going to probably have some talks from them. So I have some of those people I'm going to solicit. And I know probably from Rob Robinette and Gwyn, you know, we'll have a talk from that group and we'll have, we're going to have something from Gary here about the Solar Eclipse QSO party. So as we get closer to the abstract deadline, I'll probably be reaching out to certain people or we'll be we'll be planning, you know, what people can submit. And maybe even today, Gary, we can, you know, talk about like what we would what we how it would look from a solar eclipse QSO party standpoint. Why don't I turn it over to um, Gary now, our amateur radio communications coordinator, um, and he can go ahead and run the meeting. All right, good afternoon. I think we're all in, uh, in the afternoon looking at the participants today. So good to see everyone again. Let me uh, share my screen. Got a couple of things uh, on the agenda. Um, real quick one, uh, let's we'll pick up from last week a little bit. Um, we know that we've not heard from the league yet on our sponsorship of the SEQP, but Ed, I know you're working on that from the bottom up, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I like how, how we're working on it. So uh, I did drop a note uh, to Bob Interbitson over the weekend, sort of summarizing where we were and, and what we were asking for. And to reinforce my status as an official feather duster, Bob didn't get back to me either. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, you know, but I you know, obviously the board meeting is this week. I thought it was last week, but it is coming up this week. So, uh, you know, they've got their hands full. And I, I'm going to see him in any case uh, on February 1st which is the next okay. meeting of the publicity committee. I do know for a fact, because Bob did put it on around, is that they have made the hire regarding the uh, PR manager. And that person started on Monday. So apparently he's been obviously working with the person, uh, getting, you know, getting them you know, sort of set in place, as well as running around with the board meeting. So I'm not necessarily panicking. And I do have an opportunity to do a face-to-face -face with him on February 1st. So that's, that's my brief report show you the power that I have. I have none because we didn't get a response back very, very quickly. So anyway, but that's where we are. I, I can say I got two responses from Bob Indervidson this week. Um, and? And so I was emailing Bob about the HamSci workshop, not about the SEQP. Um, right. I did get a response back from Bob saying that he probably could not personally make the HamSci workshop, but he would... Um, give the opportunity around to the AWRL because I said I'd really like to have someone from the AWRL to be there. Good. So he said he's going to pass that around. And he also did say that the um, HamSci workshop was advertised in the uh, AWRL letter a couple of weeks ago. He sent me the link to that. And uh, he said they could probably work up something a little bit longer to talk about it as well. So Okay, that's good. That's helpful because then yeah. we're halfway there if that's the case. So, right. Okay. So okay. I think you should keep working on them from your end, Ed. Yep. So, yep. so they don't forget about us. And yep. yeah, and then hopefully, yeah, you can see them at the February 1st meeting and then hopefully we'll get the, the league here in person. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, other thing I was sort of thinking about was just also with Hamcation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who's going down, but obviously we get a chance to get in front of Bob and Dave at yeah. the same time down there. So, I mean, I, you know, from a time standpoint, I think we're still okay, so. Yeah, good. Anyway, that's my report, so. All right, well, that's good. It's good to hear from both of us. We've a little bit of progress and uh, we've still got a plan moving forward. We're definitely not stalled out, so that's a good thing. Um, if we could, I'd like to take a couple of minutes and look again at this, um, 
this uh, little blurb that the, the NASA folks wanted for their citizen science website, because I think that's a chance to get a tremendous amount of publicity from a very uh, well-respected organization. So I completely reworked what I had last week uh, based on the suggestions and uh, looking at their website a little bit. But uh, let's see. That's their website. Let's see where I'm at here. There we go. So uh, just to refresh everybody's memory, um, this is the guy we contacted uh, Nathaniel and uh, introduced to me. Uh, pretty good title. And uh, this was his ask. He said, when you're ready, please write up a paragraph or two about our project. And he gave us a link and a form to submit it to. So uh, I've, uh, hi I've copied the field names over here. So the name of the project, uh, Nathaniel, I took right off the NASA grant proposal. Um, which okay. seems to make sense. Yeah. Um, they want a little sh a shorter name, so that's pretty straightforward too. The Festival of Eclipse Ionospheric Science, that is pretty straightforward. And this is the part where I could use people's review because they, they wanted a, basically a couple of paragraphs written at the high school level, uh, no hire, no acronyms and so on and so forth that they could use on the NASA the Citizen Science website and as part of their publicity. So, uh, Here's what I've got here. The, 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 the tough thing I had is, you know, it's when people talk about looking at comets or looking at planets or there's other community science things where people are turning over rocks and counting slugs or whatnot, those things mm -hmm. are pretty straightforward and obvious. Uh, we've got something that's a little, a little bit quirky where we're working with the ionosphere. So I think you had to take a sentence or two to explain what it is, what we're trying to do before we kind of get into the details. So that's what I tried to do here on this, uh, this first paragraph. So what I've got is that the broadcasters, both amateur and professional, have been sending and receiving shortwave radio signals around the earth for over a century. Such communication is possible to due to interactions between our sun and the ionosphere, the ionized region of the earth's atmosphere located roughly 80 to 100 kilometers overhead. So that's a little, now we've got some background of what we're doing. Citizen scientists are invited to participate in studies of ionospheric variation resulting from lunar obscuration of the sun during the 2024 American total solar eclipse. So maybe obscuration isn't the most common every day. Yeah, I was wondering right about that time. one. Also, is it a thousand kilometers or a hundred kilometers, Gary? A thousand. Okay. That's what I thought. I thought I heard you say 100, and I just wanted to make sure that. He, he said 100, but he wrote 1,000. Ah, OK. No problem. I just wanted to make sure we were. And, yeah, and just, so what he wrote is, I think, correct. Yeah. yeah. One other point is American total solar eclipse. I mean, it's also in Canada um, you know, as well. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just 2024 total solar eclipse. Well, I, I mean, Canada's an American. It's North American. Yeah, North American is better. North American oh, is better. American, yeah. North American is better. Instead of saying lunar obscuration, you could say the moon's shadow. Mm. Yeah. How about the moon obscuring the sun? Would that be? That's too obscure. Personally, I'd still go with the moon's shadow. Yeah. From the moon's shadow, okay. So we don't have to mention the sun at all then. Right. Or from shadow of the moon, if you don't want the contraction, either one's the same thing. I'm just, I'm just trying to think from sitting down talking to my grandkids, what kind of questions they would have or um i i don't know if i would include shortwave maybe i'm being too picky but i think i would just say sending and receiving radio signals yeah i feel like with shortwave usually when i write shortwave i also write down 
like three to 30 megahertz or two to yep. 30 megahertz. Yep. Yeah, and of course the, the non-amateur wet back then was not shortwave. It was long wave. Right, right. 275 to 200 meters, so. One of the things I was trying to be careful of is we're not talking about the gigahertz region and GPS satellites at two or four gigs and that sort of stuff. So that's why I was I trying wouldn't, to characterize it a little bit. I wouldn't worry about that. And we can strike that. Okay, that shortens it up. Do we, so when we say um, such communication is possible, the interaction between our sun and the ionosphere, the ionized region. Um, do we want to say, is ionized too much of a technical term? What if we said the electrified region of the Earth's upper atmosphere? I think a lot of people understand ionized, but I'm not sure. Uh, I would leave it. Okay. The other thing that happens with these NASA, with this NASA news thing is that, you know, we'll submit something and they're, you know, Mark Kutchner, one of them is going to rewrite it anyway. So they may tweak some of it a bit. Mm -hmm. So even if we leave some of the technical jargon in there, they there will be some additional filter where they may be like, what about saying it this way? So. Yeah, I think it's actually good to have ionized there because you're talking about the ionosphere. And yeah. people will make that connection. That sounds good. So we're happy with the first paragraph then? Okay, that's a win. Thank you. Let me save that before we go any further. <laughs> <laughs> so then I want to get a little bit about who we are and what we're doing. Uh, members of HAMSI, the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, along with the amateur ham radio community, will be creating data for researchers by transmitting, receiving, and recording signals across, the, okay, we're gonna take shortly, across the radio spectrum, let's see. The data will include the number of radio signals transmitted from station to station, along with the distance between the stations. I think that much is, is accurate, and hopefully that's clear. Uh, let's see, the data does include those two, I agree, but uh, uh, should you put in a, a recording of the transmission? You mean the actual, uh, like, like a wave file, recordings of wave files, Jim? Or? Well, you, you say uh, above that, uh, by transmitting, receiving, and recording signals, and what are the uh, ah okay I got you. What if you just delete that next sentence? The data will include. What if you just delete that? Because there's a lot of different versions of what our data will and will not include. Yeah, yeah, that might be a good idea at this point. And you you just <laughs> say that yeah they're transmitting, receiving, and recording uh, signals across the spectrum. And then upon analysis, the data should inform. researchers how the ionosphere reacted to the eclipse. Yeah, I'm questioning your use of what the term well-known computer models. How about existing computer models? I don't know how well-known they are, whether <laughs> you've used them or not. That's a good point. But they're out there, right? Mm -hmm. They're out uh, there. I existing mean, they're computer out there. models potentially improving the accuracy, which is an accurate statement. Yeah, you might just change well-known to existing. Yeah. So the last couple of sentences, of course, were basically taken out of the uh, out of the uh, the NASA proposal too. So we kind of tie this into the proposal again. Whether they edit this stuff out is, is is unknown, but that's where these last couple of sentences came from. Mm -hmm. Also, you don't need two those. Oh, have I got that somewhere? Oh, yep, there it is. It's funny that the things these the software will correct you on, and other things it'll leave in there. 
Yeah. Also, why is eclipses at the end plural? Um, I know what I was thinking. It's probably not correct because I was a lot of the a lot of the work we've been doing involves both 2023 and 2024. Uh, so the title of our project was specific to 2024, which of course would be a singular eclipse. Well, first, the first paragraph referred to 2024. You can so okay, that's something you can change. You can actually make this. This news article, you can talk about both the 2023 and the 2024 eclipses. Mm. Okay. So Oops. this, maybe it's great to leave it in. The 2023 uh, annual uh, part. Oh, I'm sorry. And 2024. Yeah. So maybe move to, maybe move North American. Oh, okay. Yeah. 2023 annual and 2024 total North American solar eclipses. Yeah, I, I think that's good. Yeah, because um, with the grant proposal, they specifically wanted you to focus on the 2024 eclipse. So that's why the proposal was written that way. But for this general purpose PR thing, um, talking about both eclipses, I think is appropriate. Good, because I've done it both ways and I'm, I'm glad we're addressing that. Do, do we want to say during the onset and recovery phase, or do we want to say during the beginning and ending phases of the eclipse? Or am I just being too, again, I'm trying to think of a high schooler and their, their understanding or visualizing what we're saying. And may, maybe I'm being too picky, but I'm just wondering about beginning and ending. I like beginning and ending also. Yep, yep, yep. Considering the audience, that's correct. See how that looks. <clears throat> yeah, I think phases is good. I would leave that in myself, but. No, don't I, I cross pages here, but don't forget we've got our last sentence here too. That's a little bit more technical than the rest of the document. I think dynamics is fine. Is is there another word that we can use rather than rapid obscuration that would still give the same concept to somebody that's that's uh, reading this? Or is that the best word? I also thought about putting um, fast, like say fast transit across the earth or something like that. Rapid covering of the sun? Yeah, or or just shadowing. Uh, uh, rapid, uh, rapid transit obscuring the sun or shadowing is good. I like shadowing. Good afternoon, Ward. I heard N zero AX is melodious tones in there. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> All right. Hopefully, the closing the closing statement isn't too uh, is pretty straightforward. I hope here. We'll change it to short wave. Yeah. We need to put both 2023 and 2024 eclipses. Yes. Activating radio stations is a little a little dry. How about making um, shortwave radio contacts? That's a little active says we're doing something. So you want to change American to North American and consistent with yeah.
looks good. Okay, wonderful. So the next thing they did, they did want an image with everything. So I'm not sure. I'm I'm sure on some of the NASA sites that can get some nice uh, annual or total ellipse pictures and, and credit them back to NASA. That shouldn't be too hard. If there's somebody else has some other suggestions, I'm open to looking around afterwards. Well, we certainly um got a nice eclipse photo of uh, that Bill Engelke took during the 2017 eclipse that has a antenna in front of it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I saw that in your presentation. Um, yeah, so okay, I, can, you can ask Bill Engelke if it's for permission to use that, and you know that's something you could use. I'm sure you'll yeah. say yes. Yep. Um, we also have these uh, new images, these new uh, images to look at today from the graphics designers. Right. Yeah, that's next. So. Okay, I'll, I'll close this up. Thanks everyone for your help. It's definitely better than what it was. So I think Thank we're you. In pretty good shape. Thank Let me you. Close this up. Uh, I think one thing we need to um, put on our agenda at some point. I don't. I don't know that you have it explicitly on the agenda. I, you don't. But we're going to need to. We should do a review of the website again to uh, make sure that the Eclipse project is easy to find on the website. Because right now, I think if anyone goes to the website and says, you know, what's going on with the eclipses, they'll have no idea. Yeah, and that'll be appropriate once we've got these two banners in place and uh, we start connecting yeah. things. Okay. Well, that leads right into the next. Uh... So Nathaniel has a wonderful resource there at Scranton, the graphics design department. And it's been helping him uh, and us pretty up the Hampside website a little bit. So we've got the possibility of a couple of pretty nice banners here. Let me go back to the website real quick. Uh, Another place I can find it pretty quickly. This guy over here on the right. That was developed, what, in 20, for the 2017 SEQP, right? Yeah, so there was an undergrad student at NGIT named Spencer Gunning. And um, he was really good with graphic design. And I said, you know, can you make us something for this? And, and he came up with that in what seemed like five or 10 minutes. He was, I, I watched him work. It was really quite amazing. Well, as I said to Vicky, I said uh, the, the the designer of these two logos. I said if if if, if engineers and scientists did these, it'd be a bunch of straight lines and right angles, and, and it'd be all kind of <laughs> pretty dull looking. So uh, <laughs> nice to have a, a creative touch here. Uh, so the idea was just to to uh, kind of follow the format of the older SEQP logo, the colors, uh, the Art Deco look. And uh, use this as for the main banner for the landing page when people start searching on the solar eclipse QSO party and, and the other events. So she's got two versions here, very, very similar. Uh, what will happen is the logos are, the ham side logos moved up a little bit, and she's got a little bit of our ray tracing that I think was on the, uh, yeah, I like the ham the side workshop. Thing. Say again, please. I like the ray tracing. I feel like well, the first the other, doesn't have enough radio. The, uh, the other thing is, I think this gives us a little room where we have to think about later about putting a NASA logo or something in there if we get uh, uh, the grants awarded. Yeah. So I know, I know put, any other. Uh, I, I was going to suggest you might have. Um, image of continents underneath that it's kind of obscure what that uh earth is supposed to show
Need uh, we need a great circle map. That's what it would be, right? Right. <laughs> yes. And in North it would also America. be it would also be pretty cool to have a couple of stations, like maybe one at uh, around the ten o'clock and one around eight o'clock, with some kind of little broadcasting um, uh, arcs coming out of it to show that that this is associated with the. Um, uh, a radio type event. You, you mean like a word? You mean like a little like an antenna or something with like a little light? Yeah, I, I would just make out. it what people expect, which is uh, just a tower, you know, the sort of the wedge type uh, generic tower with some broadcast um, arcs coming off of it on either side. I wouldn't get into uh, you know, trying to draw an actual ham antenna or anything. That's, that's too much. I'm sure there's some clip art out there. Yeah, Vicky's pretty good. I think if we, as I sent her a couple examples and look what she, I mean, they were pretty, pretty rudimentary examples and she came up with something pretty good here, so. The two suggestions is do something more map like with 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 uh, Earth there, right? I agree. It not to be critical, I wouldn't want to do that, but but it looks the, I don't know the wavy lines. It's kind of hard to tell. I mean, we know it's the Earth, but it just it, it just looks kind of non Earthish. Yeah, uh, at least a um, ghostly image or whatever you want to call it of um, the continents below. I do like that little shadow, though, from, from the sun that is on the planet. I do like it. If we were looking down at the North Pole, that would probably work. Well, the other option is to put more of a kind of fill the earth with a representation of North America because then the shadow would show up over North America, which is what we're expecting. Mm -hmm. is, well, I was thinking if you're looking down at the North Pole and you have the the um, projection um, oriented, so yes, it's over North America, that would work. I'll bet there is a NASA picture someplace of the Earth um, that's totally clear of clouds, one of those synthetic photos mm -hmm. that they put together and um, available somewhere on their website. It doesn't have to be high risk since this would be a, just a, a sort of a graphic banner. As long as it doesn't change the deco visual look. That type of yeah. Yeah, you could yeah, save it. I really do. I do like the Art Deco ness of it. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Maybe there's an Art Deco filter. Almost steampunk. Steampunk. Very cool. <laughs> well, I mean, probably if they start with, um, you know, even I know I use the uh, Cardo Pi libraries or to generate globes and things like that. Just get the outlines of the continents. They can probably use that too. They can Art Decoize just the outlines of the continents. It's some of the graphics in Rockefeller Center, and there's probably an earth there that would work. So. By the way, I'm noticing the hamp size there three times, which is probably a bit much. Um, what you might do is just the, the ham size on the left hand, just add a dot org in that size font next to it. Yeah, I agree with that. OK. Good one, David, thank you. One thing it, it grabbed my eye and maybe everybody likes it, just it, this little, to me, this looks like a little light bulb coming out of it, or maybe because I was just changing bulbs over to LEDs today, I'm not sure. But if we, I'm not sure where that came from, but it's kind of interesting.
Oh, it does look like a little light bulb. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I noticed on the uh, main poster, uh, the moon has the wrong dark side toward the sun. It should be, if you just rotate it um, 180 degrees, it would be better. And maybe you could use the same type of a symbol, a, uh, a round, a, a circle with a, um, uh, a chunk, <laughs> the technical term, I don't know. Maybe it's a loon. That's it. It's a loon of dark um, on it to illustrate that it's not a light bulb, it's the moon. Are you talking to this guy over here next to Eclipse Ward? Yeah, just put a little loon of, of dark as, as the little loon of dark that's the same on the uh, uh, the main graphic where the moon is dark on one side. Or, or maybe make it like that other graphic. Just duplicate that. Uh, okay, yeah. now I get it. Yeah. Now I get it. The sun and the moon. I, I got it. It just, it just finally hit me. Uh, it's, uh, I think Vicky's pretty good if I if I give her a couple of uh, a couple of these ideas, she'll be able to run with them. So, did you say loon? Loon. Lima, Oscar, Oscar, November. The call of the loon. Okay, that'd be a good, that'd be a good name for the event. The loon, the loon is the nickname for the Canadian one dollar coin. The loony. Call of a loony. The loony. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we actually heard the call of the loon in Maine this summer. It's quite striking. Okay, I think that's probably good for this. I've got a page full of suggestions. I'll get back together with Vicki and uh, we'll look at reversion two very soon, I'm sure. Okay. Let's see. How about we talk with Nick a little bit? And Nick, you had some more ideas or some more questions about the uh, the medium wave monitoring project we talked about last week. I mean, here yeah, are some uh, some notes that uh, Nathaniel put together when we were discussing it after our discussion last week. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, is my audio coming through? I was having problems with it earlier. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Um, actually, it wasn't so much related to Nathaniel's um, uh, notes from last time, although those are very important. Um, and I had a couple of other thoughts to do with, with those, but um, you can put that aside. Hey, Robert, right just a second. Let me move something else. Sorry. Um, it was more to do with the, um, uh, you know, the uh, scientific. Uh, aims of, of the experiment and some questions to do with that. So uh, let me see if I can bring out uh, the shared screen. Oh, somebody, oh yeah, okay. Uh, so now you're gonna let me share the screen. Okay. And uh, let's see, where are we? Um, oh, crap. Sorry about that. For some reason, it's not bringing up the one I want. Um, maybe something's going on here. Sorry. Uh, here we go. Okay. Um, and these were the science requirements um, uh, to do uh, how to do uh, dawn and dusk ionospheric var variability as observed by HF Doppler shift me measurements, etc. Um, I'm sure you can read them faster than I can read them out to you. Um, but uh, maybe what I'll do is I will just jump to the questions that are related to parts of these. And this is the ones to do with uh, um, the NSF grant, which uh, I believe has already happened and to do with the development of the great version two. 
Um, so, um, you know, first of all, there's the term ionospheric response uh, in, in these requirements. Is, does that refer only to Doppler shifts observed on the carriers of amplitude modulated signals? Um, I wasn't clear on that. Uh, is there any answer to that? Uh, maybe Nathaniel? No, it, it doesn't. So in general, the ionospheric response does not refer only to Doppler shift. But you have to remember when you, the uh, NSF grant was specifically talking about the grape system, which monitors Doppler shifts. So right. yes. the, okay. So these, these questions are perhaps less, some of them are less applicable to, you know, the solar eclipse QSO party where you're not measuring Doppler shifts carefully. Uh, right. So, so this, this the requirement here, even though it's addressing, you know, the uh, the great version two, um, you know, which is to do with Doppler shifts. Um, you're in general anything that yes. could be, um, you know, sort of derived as a, you know, a, a, um, an ionospheric response, um, you know, could be used, uh, you know, in, in the approach to the experiment. Okay. Um, and this one addresses the next question addresses specifically the great version two, which is um, has three uh, receiver frequencies, um, and I believe they were addressing uh, WWV on five and fifteen megahertz or CHU on three point three seven point eight five and fourteen to six point six seven megahertz, um, and that's in addition, I think, uh, to uh, well, it's 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 instead of the original ten megahertz. So what extra details is likely to be obtained or what, what is the reason for having added those uh, two extra frequencies? Um, in addition to just the single frequency? Yes. Um, so if you're looking at different frequencies, different frequencies are going to refract off of different parts of the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. So you might be sensing different altitudes in the ionosphere. So that's one reason. Mm -hmm. and um, Two, uh, you know, if you go there, it may, it's, if you look at what all of them are doing, it's going to give you somewhat of a fuller picture because they're not all going to behave the same way. So like right. okay. on the HF uh, bands. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, no, okay. I, I think what you're doing is just leading into what was my, you know, proper question to do with this is that, uh, that's what I, that's what I thought your reply would be. I okay. think that, um, that leads into then something could be gained by monitoring Doppler shifts at, the, say, the high end, at least, of the medium wave band, if there were appropriate targets. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Okay. And, um, and in fact, David McGaw on this call, his team monitors Doppler shifts on AM all of the time. Uh, yes. No, I was, I, I was aware of that. Um, but that was to do with um, uh, traveling ionospheric disturbances, wasn't it? Not necessarily related to the solar eclipse. That's true, but you could yeah. um, use the same system to see Correct. what's going on with yeah. this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, 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 given that that's the case, um, would it be best to be looking for targets, target stations, medium wave stations that were in similar locations to WWV and CHU transmitters? Um, yeah, there's probably some value to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because then you, then you could potentially be sampling the same same paths. Same path. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that that would be you know sort of a you know a first a first approach perhaps um, right you know not not yeah, saying so, it would so be you'd be looking you would be looking at transmitters near WWV yeah Is there, yeah yeah, yeah okay. that that makes a lot of sense because then you'd essentially be you might have stations that on M on medium wave and on HF that are essentially looking at the same paths yeah yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so that would be a, a good first approach to take. Um, yeah. yeah in, in, and, you know, a lot of it's going to boil down to, you know, really who's going to be submitting, you know, what data is submitted anyway, because it may not be possible to actually uh, winkle out those signals. Um, right. It's uh, certainly, it's more likely than it used to be, uh, shall we say, because uh, there's a, 
uh, you know, there's a group that actually zeroes in on the exact carrier frequencies to within a, within a hertz um, mm-hmm. uh, or within point, point 0.1 hertz, really, of, uh, um, you know, so, so differentiating them from other signals. So uh, it may be possible to zero in on a particular carrier and have it differentiated enough from other carriers on the frequency that you could see shifts. Okay, well, so I'll aim for that then. Okay, the other final thing was uh, to do with this requirement anyway, was uh, dawn to dusk, uh, dawn and dusk recordings. Now, we're talking about like a two years uh, series of dawn and dusk recordings um, with this. And that's certainly not gonna happen with, with uh, you know, the, the sort of medium wave uh, DXer. Um, is there any, anything to be gained by asking them to say do a, you know at least a one time you know sort of dawn and dusk on the day itself um of the uh, of the eclipse uh, yeah i think so okay uh all right well and and we'll, they could even they might even you know do it um a few times not just you know maybe mm-hmm. not two years but maybe they yeah. do it you know like 10 times or something and it's also a good practice because um, th- that gives them something that they could practice leading up to the eclipse. Mm-hmm. So not, it would not only serve as practice, but it could serve as like control data or comparison data. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly good to keep in mind. Um, yeah. the, 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 the main difference between the data that would be coming from the medium wave uh, DXer and the grape data is the grape data is essentially audio data, is that correct? Uh, um, yes. Yeah. So it's it's quite small in terms of uh, memory space, um, and uh, the uh, you know like the, the the more recording that is done, like the sort of all band recording, uh, we're getting to the point where there's sort of really huge amounts of data as well as as time spent in in actually gathering it. But certainly, uh, I, I guess giving the option, you know, somebody's really enthusiastic and has the has the disk space to say, yeah, if you could do sort of five days leading up and five days afterwards, that would be great. You know, do as mm-hmm. much as you can, um, you know, in terms of getting dawn and dusk recordings as well. Uh, right. So, okay. And, uh, you know, they if you do have them focus on specific um, transmitters, th- they could potentially just record around that one transmitter, not the whole band. And then that right. would reduce that would reduce the storage requirements, which would allow them to record Correct. for longer periods of time. Correct, and and that that would sort of um, mean that there would be some, you know, once one gets an idea of how many, who is actually likely to be contributing, mm-hmm. you could look ahead and sort of say, you're likely to be receiving this station at dawn and dusk. Right. And, you know, maybe we can actually do some recordings, maybe we can look at the recordings before the eclipse, you know, even, you know, a week or two weeks or three weeks before the eclipse and actually do a quick scan and sort of say, um, can you do more of, you know, sort of just a frequency range of, um, say, only a couple of hundred kilohertz rather than, um, you know, like the full 1.2 megahertz or something like that. Right. Okay, th- those, those are uh, good things to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, okay. The, uh, I would also, one other comment, Nick, it's very yeah. minor, but I would, mm-hmm. instead of calling these science requirements, I'd call them science questions. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's more just me having sort of, a, uh, you know, sort of pick, pick something out of a hat here. Right. right. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, I will, I will make a note of that in terms of, you know, eventually getting to the point where you're going to publicize this and say, these, you know, this is what we're trying to do. Um, you know, uh, r- rather than you say uh, requirements, uh, yeah. you know, I, I agree. Okay, um, this is the uh, um, the objectives in this case. I seem to have picked out of the hat, um, and the uh, and again, I will you know sort of leave that just up on the screen for people to to read. Um, but uh, uh, the first one was assessing the accuracy of model predictions from bottom side, bottom side ionosphere. And what you were using was a program called Farlap, is that correct? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Um, that does not have 
uh, it doesn't claim to have uh, you know much of a response at medium wave frequencies. Is that correct? As far yeah. as I know, yeah. um, you know, I, I haven't like I don't think um, the absorption is put in there really well. I think we'd have to we wouldn't be able to just use it like straight out of the box. I think we'd have to yeah. figure out how to use that a little bit better. Right. Yeah. So so in other words, there would not be any sort of modeling. Uh, or not easy modeling done ahead of time. Um, yeah. At, at medium wave frequencies. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, uh, you know, it would be more a matter of after the fact, sort of saying, "Hey, this looks really interesting. We should model it." <laughs> uh, rather yeah. Than, um, but, you know. Well, I I would say that uh, ahead of time, um, we should hopefully have the SAMI three ionospheric electron densities outputs available so mm -hmm. that if you wanted to you know visualize what the what the atmosphere is predicted to look like ahead of time we should be able to do that ahead of time and use that for some planning purposes and you could okay. start playing around with some of the modeling and then also that's, this that's where, actually this is where the dawn and dusk thing becomes useful again too because mm -hmm. you can start you know you observe dawn and dusk every day so if you want to start trying to model some things you could try modeling dawn and dusk Right. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yeah, but yeah, I think that's a good, you know, like if, it, if you're actually visualizing what the state of the ionosphere is going to be, um, you know, ahead of time, then, you, you know, you're, not, you're still not going to be able to predict, say, um, medium wave frequency paths, um, yeah. uh, you know, unless you, <laughs> unless you really understand, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the propagation mechanisms. But okay. uh, it at least gives an idea of what's occurring, and, and the sort of medium, the sort of DXer who would be participating in something like this would have a pretty clear idea of you know layers of the ionosphere and so forth. The one thing that would be missing, I almost certain in Farlap, would be the, the D region, um, okay. uh, which is actually the major determinant of whether or not there's actually going to be any reception in medium wave. Is, is, is uh, you know it, once once that's uh, dissipated yeah. that's when the signals start coming in so, uh, the, so the real key the real key to this first there's like two parts to it mm -hmm. so far lap needs to start with a a model ionosphere and mm -hmm. that's what uh sammy three would do so we might be able to i think sammy three has the d region in there as well but you know we might be able to have oh, okay we might be able to have joe huba who would be the one, he'd be the person running SAMI3. We might be able to have him mm. come on the call and help answer some questions we may have about. Yeah, that. And Joe's also going to be at the HAMSI workshop. So if you're coming to the HAMSI workshop, you have a chance to ask him all of your questions in okay. person over the beverage of your choice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, good selling point. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, that's that, that would be very interesting to find out because if, if, if the D region is is modeled, then that would definitely allow for, you know, sort of just eyeballing visualization of, of yeah. what's going to be happening because right. what, what you're doing is predicting yeah, what's going then, to happen as the eclipse progresses, right. correct? Yeah. And once yeah. you once you have um once you have your model ionosphere, which is what SAMI3 gives us, mm -hmm. then Farlap is the thing that does the ray tracing through that ionosphere. Right. So, so if you and you can set Farlap to whatever frequency you want, so you can set it down to medium wave frequencies. Um, I just know it's usually used at HF frequencies, and um, I haven't really looked into using it for medium wave. Right. It's just that most most ionospheric. Um, you know, propagation programs that I've been aware of over the years, and I'm not an expert, uh, essentially say, you know, anything below three megahertz or two megahertz is, right. uh, you're on your own. <laughs> yes, um, good luck. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, see, so we're running out of time here. So um, the, um, how is the onset recovery uh, asymmetry determined or is, or to be determined, um, you know, is, what, well, what's we, the techniques that are used there? I mean, the easiest thing to look at is my 2000, um, the paper I did for 2017. Mm -hmm. So you can see how there's some sort, how there's a bit of an asymmetry there, mm -hmm. um, where the I think uh, the onset is faster than the recovery. The recovery is a little bit longer. So 
I think that's our starting point for things to look right. at. Yeah, and, and oddly a medium wave, you know, what, what we were finding was that the onset was slower um, as if uh, it took longer for the, 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 uh, the, the D region to sort of basically uh, dissipate. Uh -huh. um, you know, so uh, there, there may be some interesting possibilities there, but, I, you know, because I am aware of what you do in your paper and there's also some stuff in uh, Bamford about the, uh, um, you know, what she was, you know, making assumptions about what was happening as the right. eclipse progressed. Um, okay, um, but that has more to do with signal strength, correct? You know, and, 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 you know, in, in terms of how, you know, sorry, go ahead. Signal strength instead of? Well, inst instead of, uh, you know, sort of Doppler observations or something of that nature. Yeah, well, I think there's yeah. kind of a connection between the two. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Um, and I think uh, that's probably um, probably enough, you know, right now, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I'm hoping that, you know, just the questions are in general helping people sort of visualize, you know, what is, you know, I, you know, what, how, how, you know, how the uh, data process is going to progress and so forth. But uh, anyway, that's helped, helped me a lot um, in, in terms of, you know, thinking about this. So I better throw it back to you, Gary, because I think we're running out of time. I think it looks great. Uh, Gary, I think something we should add to our agenda, if, uh, we can talk about briefly today, um, but definitely within the next week or so, we should talk about what we want um, the HAMSI workshop to look like in terms of the eclipse. So as I'm making up the program for the HAMSI workshop, I kind of have in my mind, you know, so many talks are going to be about the personal space weather station, so many talks are going to be about the eclipse. So many talks may be about um, sort of this historical perspective that Ron, uh, KF7ZN, and um, Bob W1XP were talking about. So many talks are going to be about traveling atmospheric disturbances. So many talks might be about, you know, contributed things. Um, so I think we, I think we should have a series of talks about um, eclipse impacts. So I think, um, you know at least one should come from this group for the solar eclipse QSO party. We should have one about HF Doppler shifts, you know, et cetera. So uh, got it. would you like to, we have to figure out who wants to give those talks. Okay. Maybe um, Nick, do you want to come down mm -hmm. to Scranton in March and uh, give a talk about <laughs> medium? <laughs> Not sure I'm going to actually be able to physically get there. Uh, <laughs> um, well, if we provided some assistance, some yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's not. It it wouldn't be financial. Or the problem is not financial. I um, you know I'm, I'm I'm definitely willing to sort of pull out my wallet for something like that. Yeah. It was more just you know other commitments that I have at the same time. So. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I I guess the first thing really, you know, like if you're looking for some sort of proposal for a, you know, a, a uh, um, you know, a, some you know, some sort of talk or something like that, you need to have those by the by the end of the month, don't you? Yeah. The first, yeah. Okay, and that could be done by Zoom. It could be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So I mean, the first thing would be, you know, you're you if you mail me down, you'd have to mail me down and say whether you, I, I would give a talk at all. And you know, so let me try and put something together in terms of a proposal by uh, February first, which is the deadline. And okay, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. That sounds really good because I think in my head I'm imagining I'd like to have a talk about the solar eclipse GSO party. I'd like to have a talk about um, what the group is doing. I'd like to have a talk about you know, I, I think the medium wave things would be a good talk. We have, you know, maybe Jonathan Rizzo or um, Morris Cohen or someone from his group would talk about um, VLF uh, sorts of things. Um, so I, it may be Steve Serwin, um, he might give a talk too. So th there's like four, you know, we could easily have three or four talks all about eclipses and the different things we're doing. Okay. Okay, I've got those notes. Uh think about this week. Okay.
All right. Um, and that, okay, that would be good too, if, because if we have that section, if we have a whole like eclipse session within the HAMSI workshop, then that that's kind of going to be like our real launch point for all of this. That's where we want to have, you know, get the ARRL to be there to see this, and then they can watch all the presentations and ask us questions and we can dialogue and things like that. Got it. Nathaniel. Yeah. I uh, got a question here. It's maybe a little off topic. Uh, I have an email here from the National Science Foundation requesting uh, some information. Yes, from that's me. graphic information. So for people who have been participating in the Personal Space Weather Station project, um, some of you I have entered in as a project participant into the system. And uh, if you were entered in as a project participant you have gotten an email um, asking for some demographic information. So as the PI, I'm supposed to officially ask that you fill that out. Um, whether or not you really want to is up to you. I never find out if you fill it out or not. I don't know what they do with that data. Um, but if, if you did get an email from the NSF, it is official. You know, go ahead, fill it okay. out. It's a very minimal survey. It's basically name, rank, and serial number? Something like that. Okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, regarding hotel, the uh, got my hotel reservation, and I'm just right now uh, getting the registration for myself and the XYL. That's great for the in person. We're going to drive there. Wonderful. From Detroit. That'll be really good. Yeah, the hotel is up. So if you are if you are going, you can call the go on the Hamsai website, call the hotel and make your reservations. Yeah. You, and it, recommend it, that people do that. Yeah. And I did get the rate. And when you include tax, it's something like 125 or something a night, including tax. Which is a really good rate for hotels these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. So I, I think what, so Gary, kind of a big picture sort of thing. Um, I think over we should really kind of view the HAMSI workshop as like the big kickoff for getting this whole solar eclipse festivals thing off the ground. So we should plan on making sure that our website is completely up and running and ready for visitors by the HAMSI workshop. And then we should have a nice set of somewhere between three to six talks that we have planned for the HAMSI workshop um, to really talk, explain what we're planning on doing for the eclipses. Got it. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but uh, two months from today, we'll be looking back on the Hampside Workshop, believe it or not, let's say the 19th. And then, oh uh, my gosh. Yep. And four Going months fast. from today, four mm. months today, we'll be down in Xenia, those of us that are going down there. So, yeah, I've, I've made a bunch of hotel room reservations for that already. I don't know how many people are going from uh, like my students and stuff, but I, I made, um, I did make a bunch of reservations already. So yeah, it's going fast. Um, Are we going to do the, uh, the the white lab coats again this year? Yes. So I need to get that set up too. Yeah. I I know it, John had trouble because it was a last minute thing last year and I don't want to, want to be sewing my own lab coat. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I can, I can get you that information sooner rather than later if you like. Where are you going to guys be staying, uh, Nathaniel? Where's your crew going to be staying? Um. The courtyard, I think it's the Marriott Courtyard at the University of Dayton. Ah, so it's more of downtown Dayton. Yeah, we're we're right in the heart of Dayton there. Okay, I can um, give and, I can give you the weather forecast for the Hamvention right now. What what's the weather going to be? Rain. Uh, fr Friday, <laughs> partly to mostly Dayton. Saturday, <laughs> chance of Dayton. Sunday, hundred percent chance of Dayton. Oh my gosh. So before we go here, I want to <laughs> show something fun that people who have been on my telecons earlier this week have already seen this, but I think there are still some people who have not seen this yet. Uh, the Murgas Amateur Radio Club K3YTL um, did a really nice job putting together this exhibit that is now on display here at the University of Scranton called Amateur Radio Through the Ages. And so they we have these display cases upstairs in this building. Um, 
and you can see which way am I? And they have very kindly filled it with all sorts of QSL wow. cards and boat anchors and all sorts of amateur radio goodies. There's some good helicrafter stuff there. Oh, it's beautiful stuff. And these are 100, that's a QST from July 1922. Wow. And there's another one. And I thought this one's really cool because it says devoted exclusively to citizen radio. So since we're a citizen science project, I thought that was really neat. And here's one doing away with the static from March of 1925. Oh, wow. A Q multiplier, a Heath kit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we've got that in there. Quite a few people have pointed out that Q multiplier. Oh, there's some swan equipment. And uh, it looks like a swan there. I don't think there's any swan stuff in there. There's some Ken. Oh, TS520. That's an 830, actually. Oh, OK. Yeah, but which, of course, is very close to a 520. What yeah. was the brown radio or whatever it was? Yeah, what's that? That's a silver tone. Oh, okay. Oh, you're right. It's a Yesu. It's not a swan. It's a Yesu. But those yeah. are some Kenwoods there also. Kenwood twins, right? Yeah. Oh, and a, and a, and a D104 microphone. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll put the link to this in the chat. So, um, wait, hold on. I have a, I've got a link for the whole album here. I can, right here. Uh, no, right here. Copy link. There we go. I'll put this in the chat. And so then anyone who wants to look at these up close and see exactly what's in there, you can peruse on your own whenever you like. Anybody that see finds their own QSL card in, the, in those exhibits wins a banana or something. I don't That's know. That's <laughs> right. You get a prize. But yeah, there's, if you can there's, find your own then everyone who goes to uh, the, the conference in March has to buy you an 807. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, this was really, really good stuff. I'm trying to figure out what the horse was in the balcony of that building out the window, but that's, I mean, that's oh. not for now. Uh, well, a few, actually, that question came up in the Tuesday morning telecon. <laughs> um, so this thing right over here. So maybe about 20 years ago or something like that, um, there there was this fad where all the towns would um, they, they'd have some they'd ha they all find their, have their mascot and they had them made up in fiberglass and then they give those fiberglass mascots to local artisans who then paint them in different ways. So like in in West Orange, New Jersey, um, where Thomas Edison was, they had fiberglass light bulbs all over town. And down in Blacksburg, Virginia, for Virginia Tech, they had hokey birds. Well, here is it's coal mining country over here. So they had mules that would go down into the coal mines. So this is one of those uh, coal mining mules that's painted up by a local artist and now sitting on the back of the uh, Historical Society building. Yeah, my first thought was a fraternity trick, but OK, that's a pretty good story. <laughs> yeah. And so then also along with this, um display i do we're coming up with this uh poster here i can find the find the correct window here there come on all right i got my meetings folder campsite workshop display cases i can copy the link to the clipboard We'll see if I get this right this time, David. My God. So see if that um, link in the chat works. I'm putting this display up in the hall, this poster up in the hallway too, to kind of give everything context. Yeah, the poster comes up great. Five nine on that uh, poster. Thank you. So yeah, so that it's not there in the hallway yet, but we're we're gonna get that printed out over the next few days and 
try to get that up before the students come back next week. Oh, there's still uh it's still winter break or yeah, semester? classes start on January 25th. Oh, are you in your uh, office there? The at the work at the office? Yeah, you're not home. Nathaniel, you should definitely send that poster to um, HQ uh, for them to look at and, and say, you know, we need kind of a, a template like this with some of this um, with without making it too University of Scranton specific, but it introduce amateur radio science that could yeah. go um, in museums and other public places where there's a display. You know, Ward, that also would look nice one of these times in that that uh, the newer magazine, the uh, on the air as a full page um, deal. Yeah, it'd be a might, centerfold. Yeah, a centerfold. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. I think the, the of course, people reading OTA are already amateurs, mm -hmm. but um, so we need kind of a combination of we need to introduce. It's what I called inside outreach, which is uh, making other hams aware of scientific um, activities. And then there's outside uh, outreach, which is reaching out to the public to let them know that we're around and that doing this kind of stuff. So the poster is kind of a start in both directions. Yeah. I think a nice full page thingamajig. Send it to uh, Becky. Okay. I will be happy to do that. So yeah, so that's what I've been up to. Oh, you're using your so-called time off pretty well, we can see. <laughs> I don't understand why. So Mary Lou will find this funny. When I was an undergraduate, I thought it was uh, amazing being a professor because they had all of this time off. They taught so few classes and then they had all this extra time. Boy, did it, was I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've learned a lot since I first met you, Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, I think I better go. Um, it's Anthony's fourth birthday, so we have to go have a little birthday party for him. Oh, isn't that cute? Yeah. How old is he? Four for my granddaughter's three and she just got a Ada scientist um, outfit for Christmas, which has a lab coat, you know, and the, I, I don't know if you ever watched the uh, Ada scientist uh, cartoons on TV. It's about a, a girl who does sciencey things and she's, you know, six, seven, eight, something like that. And yeah. then she can take off her lab coat and it's got a dress inside it so she can go back and forth, you know, whatever. Anyway, so Samantha Ellen bought her a Ada scientist outfit kit and it comes with various accessories. And one of them was safety goggles, right? Uh -huh. so, so she's decided those are safety gobbles, G-O-B-B. -B. Uh -huh. <laughs> so safety gobbles. Yeah. I like that. Anthony just special. got, he just got toy safety goggles too. I like putting the fireplace on at our house at night. And he now insists that I wear his toy safety goggles every time I try to do anything with the uh, fireplace. <laughs> there you go. I was soldering and a big old piece of solder flew up and hit my safety goggles here. <laughs> and um, Oh, you know what the big hit though was um, at Christmas was a magnifying glass. Mm. And after she learned how to use it, which is not put it right up at your eye, but you know, you have to kind of do this. Oh, she looked at everything. <laughs> Very simple, but magic. It's got super growing power. Wow. After I walked into my, uh, I heard uh, some noises coming from my office and I walked in <clears throat> and there's my three-year-old grandson with his foot on the uh, pedal switch and the microphone down. And I had left the radio on because I was trying to work some DX. And he's on there going in his little tiny voice, KF7ZN, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Can anybody hear me? I'm here. And thank heavens, uh, he didn't transmit out, but he now has his own little microphone to play with. So mm -hmm. that was kind of, um, 
disconcerting when I walked in the room and saw him standing there doing that. Wow. It's amazing how fast they pick up on some of that. Yeah, he knows my call sign really well from listening. That's great. Well, everyone, I better go. Thank you so much. Hi, right, good meeting today. Look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thank you. 7-3. So long.